let me ask you, so you, you, you got into this question of the limits of science mm -hmm. and, uh, and the idea that there are things that science just can't explain. I think you mentioned love and things like that. Mm -hmm. now, now, first of all, the idea that science can explain everything and that, that, that nothing else, humanities, anything has any role is referred to as scientism, I guess, mm -hmm. a, a very expansive conception of science's legitimate domain. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, let me ask you, the, your view that some things are beyond the kin of science, it sounds like you would have held that view even if we were in the late 19th century and we hadn't yet seen the weirdest things about physics, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, even if, even if physics were Newtonian still and kind of deterministic and a little easier to make sense of, Mm -hmm. You would still say that, look, this, it is in the nature of subjective experience to not be ultimately reducible to physical laws. Is that is that right? I think the way that I approach this is I don't believe that there is, as it were, a soul waiting to be put into a body when the body is conceived. I think that the human being comes into being as a physical entity and then gradually, you know, a brain and then a psychology develops within that being. What I do believe is that once the psyche structure of the being is formed, you know, once it becomes a sentient being, I don't believe that you can explain at least what's interesting to me about psychology and the nature of consciousness through understanding the physiological laws, which doesn't mean to say at all that we're not going to find fascinatingly interesting things by, say, the project of Christoph Coe to find the neurological correlates of consciousness. I think it will be fascinating to see what is going on physiologically when we are, say, frightened or when we feel elated or when we feel joy. But I don't think that any amount of understanding and explaining the neuro, neural potentials and synapses, etc., is going to capture what is important about love or joy or any of the other emotions. And I think it's a bit like this. It seems to me, I don't actually see this as a particularly controversial position. It seems to me that this is akin to the following. We understand that there is a molecular basis to life. Life, you know, we are all made up of DNA and proteins and we've got a pretty good handle on how all that works. That said, when we talk about a giraffe or we talk about giraffes as a group, we don't resort to molecular biology. And we have people studying giraffe habitats and giraffe interactions because we want to hopefully save these critters. And that's got nothing to do with molecular biology, although we now might put, you know, do DNA samples to see if there are genetic bottlenecks going on. But we understand giraffes, as it were, as a thing that exists, as it were, at some level of descriptiveness where the physical stuff underneath them is not really the important stuff. And I think that's true of human behavior. I'm not opposed to people doing neurological studies or DNA studies at all. I think it's all fascinating. But I think the most um, insightful book I've ever read about human behavior is the divine comedy dante's book which was written you know in 1420 um so sorry 1320 i don't think that um you know that book is ever going to be superseded as a source of insight about the human psyche because humans actually are whole beings with complex sets of relationships that in and of themselves become a worthy study of of a, a worthy subject of study that cannot ever be that part of us cannot be reduced to the laws of physics now is that partly because subjective experience is inherently private i mean you 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 you, you can measure correlates of it in a in a very scientific way and 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 i mean you can see what's going on with the neurons or, or uh while mm -hmm. someone is saying, I feel afraid, but, and, and, and the report that they feel afraid is also something that's publicly observable, but, but the actual feeling of afraidness is something that only they have access to, right? 
I mean, yes, and I, I think I mean I think th there is that inner subjectivity of it that, as you say, the feeling of intense privacy. Uh, and I think there's also another thing, which is that each of us feels afraid, whatever afraid is, under very very different conditions. So afraidness, the, the notion of afraidness is affiliated with completely different things, completely different things for different people. So here's the thing, I'm terrified of snakes. Even though I grew up in Australia where we had lots of them, I'm just, it's the one thing I'm absolutely phobic about. I can happily rescue people from spiders, picking up big crawly spiders doesn't bother me one bit. Some people um, aren't afraid of any animals, but I know people who are absolutely terrified to get on airplanes. I can't relate to that at all. I have no fear of airplanes. Some people are absolutely terrified to sit exams. Some people are terrified to have their photo taken. So, you know, even if we work out what exactly is neurologically going on during the emotion of fear, that in no way casts light on what are the things that I feel frightened about or you feel frightened about or the person across the street feels frightened about. Mm. That seems to me to be inherently personal and somehow related to your history, okay. your unique history.